All right, good evening, everyone. All right, so now we're just going to enter into a time of worship, so feel free to stand and let's get ready to praise the Lord. God, we do thank you. Lord, we invite you into this place tonight. Um, God, we come with an expectation to meet with you, to do what you want to do, to say what you want to say in our lives. So I'm, we thank you, God, that you're here with us, God. We give you all the praise and the glory in your name. Amen. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, why don't you wave, say hi to somebody across the room or the row for you? Or shout, that's good. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, well, we just want to welcome you uh, here to Journey. Just a few quick announcements. We do want to welcome those that are joining us online and just remind everybody that is an option. Um, so for, uh, we usually have a mom's group, and that is kicking off on this Monday. 
It'll be out at the pavilion at 6 p.m. So if you're interested in getting connected with that, definitely come. I think we're going to have a bonfire and just have a good old time. Um, and then fall pro pro programming has started on Wednesday night. So there's something for kids, youth, adults. Um, we have, they have a couple adult classes going. So there is it's all going on. Feel free to come and check it out. And then we just want to say thank you for um, faithfully giving in this time. Um, online is an option, mailing it. Lots of ways you can do that. Um, also, the Tithely app is our new thing. So if you want to down that, download that on your phone, it's another way that you can give. Um, but we're going to get back into worship. And so feel free to stand, join us. Let's just be intentional about engaging with the Lord, giving him our praise just loving on him tonight. So join with us. Blessed be your name, land that is planted. With streams of abundance, so blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. This pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take. You give and take away. Oh, you give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. to die. 
song of humility that we bow down and it's the only posture for a believer is to bow down toward God. Today has been called a national day of prayer and repentance and so let's join together before we read the word um, in a collective sense of prayer and repentance for our country. Would you join me please? So God thank you for allowing us to be here today. It's an honor and a privilege in a wonderful country like this a beautiful state and city to be able to gather together as believers with absolutely no fear of what we say, what we believe in, who we believe in. We're free to declare your goodness and your grace. We, we occasionally meet some hostility or some resistance, and that's because the enemy does not like you or what you have to say. And yet, God, we as believers join together calling upon you for a truly secular world. We're asking for mercy and for grace, God. We're asking you to do what we don't deserve, to intervene, God, in this place, to intervene in our country, to intervene in our state, to intervene in places like Louisville and, and Portland and Seattle. And we pray, God, that you would, that you would come and make your presence known. God, without, without making, taking any sides, without taking part in, be partisan in any way, shape, or form, God, we ask for your help because you're the only one that can help. No law will help. No people will help. No election will help. Nothing will help except you and your righteousness to say enough is enough. And so, God, we ask that you would come. We don't deserve it, but we ask for it anyway. We call upon you, God, in a humble heart. We bow down before you. God, together 
we can acknowledge it is, it's not hard, it's not a stretch to say as a people we have gone astray, we have taken what you have given to us and squandered it. Yet God, some of us are coming back to you say, will you please have mercy on us? Will you please, God, have mercy upon us? Will you please, God, stop the rioting? and establish justice which does not exist right now. God, would you please stop the rancoring and the bickering and the shouting and the hollering and the anger and replace it with goodness and grace. God, would you please. And I pray, God, that righteous men and women would rise and shine brightly. And I pray, God, that in the light of your word and of those who stand upon your word, those who are evil and would harm would scurry back to the holes that they belong in. We pray, God, that you would help us. We ask it in your name. God, as we open your word, we pray that our own hearts would be changed because we really need to be changed by you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a seat today. Thank you for joining me in prayer. And I do hope that you will continue to pray. We need Jesus to rise up and to be take his rightful place in this land. So, we, uh, if you'll open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, we'll read just four verses, verses 13 through 16 together. The sermon series, While We Wait, You Are the Light of the World. We're going to talk about being salt and light while you wait. The series about waiting, waiting is one of, do you know that waiting is one of the most common responses to God when we present to him our anxieties? Wait. Or our prayers? Wait. Or our hopes or our dreams? Hey, wait a while. The Bible has at least seven different words for the word wait, like we need that many. 246 times at least it says wait in the Bible. I mean, that's a lot of waiting. That, that just is a lot of waiting and yet waiting is what we need to do in order to get what God wants us to have, right? So even one of our more, more, more famous scripture verses, Isaiah 40, 31, those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will rise up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. Don't you want to be able to run without getting tired all the time? Don't you want to actually soar like you? Well, you got to wait. You got to wait. They say patience is a virtue. Patience is surely a, a fruit of the Spirit, and good things come to those who wait. Patience is actually a sign of maturity because, you know, they call that delayed gratification or whatever. I say patience is a waste of time, and yet patience waiting is what we're supposed to do. And as we look for the return of Christ, it's what we should do, to wait. Wait, well, while we're waiting, what do we do? We stare up in the sky, maybe today? Or is there things that we ought to be doing while we're, while we're waiting? While we're waiting for Jesus to return because he is coming. You know, growing up, my dad traveled a fair amount as, uh, when I was a kid. And uh, he would go every couple of weeks. He'd be gone for two, three, four, five, some, up two weeks. And, and he would leave all five of us kids home with mom. Sometimes I think that's a good reason to go travel. But that's beside the point. And, uh, and we knew mom was coming, my dad was coming home. We always knew he was coming back because mom would tell us, just you wait till your father comes home. <laughs> oh, we heard that a lot. Just you wait till your father comes home. So we never had any doubt dad was coming home. And I knew just how to wait for my dad as he came home. I mean, what I mean is I knew how to wait for my dad when he came home. Uh, and because mom, the longer it went, the more that twitch, you know, mm, we <laughs> And, and, and when dad always came home the same time in the evening, always the same time, we always very predictable. And so what I would do, especially if I was, uh, there was a lot of twitching that day, that I would make sure that I was busy doing something really good when dad came home. My favorite thing to do would be cutting the lawn, whether it needed or not. And dad would come down that long drive, long road, and then down our long driveway, there I'd be, hey dad. Dad would come in, I'm sure he shut down that car and said, oh, it's good to be home. There's my son. That would take the edge off everything mom would <laughs> say about what I was truly doing while we were waiting. <laughs> what are we supposed to be doing while we're waiting? We're supposed to be reaching out to those who are lost. And so today is about the values that we have reaching out. You'll see it on the orange signs out. We are as a body of believers supposed to be constantly 
reaching out to those that are lost. So let's, let's, re let's read this passage of Scripture, um, thir uh, four verses. Verse 13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how will it may be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck measure. That's a, like a bushel. But on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. As you read that passage, perhaps you have noticed, as I had, uh, there, are, there are two you are's. There's, there's two impossibilities. There's one, well, why would you do that? And there's one big picture. So let's talk about those things. There's a couple of you are's, okay? You, you, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. We're, we're salty Christians. That's what we are. We're salty. Uh, now, salt in the Bible times was not only a flavor enhancer like it is today, but it was a preservative. Uh, if you've ever had popcorn without salt, you know that it, you know, you know it's just not good. It, it needs a little bit of the good stuff, right? Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And it was also a preservative, very, very important preservative, because if you shoot the cow, the whole family can't eat the cow in one sitting. And so they would preserve it with, it was, the, it was the only way to preserve things, really was drying it and salting it. And it can last for years. And even in modern times, up until very recently, it was salt was a primary method of preserving meat. Ships would go on long voyages for years, and they would salt the, uh, the, 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 the meat when they left. It would last for a long time. And so we are the salt of the earth, meaning we, 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 we enhance and we preserve. We are also the light of the world, a city on a hill. Now, light in the Bible is both the light that we're, we know of, like the, this bright, this light. Woo, we're in the light, right? That's light. But it's also, when the Bible says the word light, it also means something that gives forth light, like a lamp or a, a torch or or fire, or, or perhaps like a flashlight. This would, if you see the word in the Bible, it's talking about a flashlight, kind of. So we now have highly efficient LED lighting. All of the lights in this room is LED. I mean, oh, amazingly efficient. And, and it's just, this is LED light, and it's just amazing. A little tiny little dot, little tiny little dot can give out so much light. And, and poor old Thomas Edison's filament you know, invented in 1879 in, Melrose, in uh, Melville Park in New Jersey, not far from where I grew up. And, uh, and that, that's like a thing of the past. Who uses filaments any, any, anymore? LEDs. We are LED lights. No, really. We are light-emitting disciples for Jesus. That's what we are. Light in the Bible stands for a number of things. Light in the Bible stands for knowledge as opposed to ignorance, we now see the light. Oh, now we're in, we're, we're in the light. Or it, it, it draws, it, it, uh, it stands for purity as opposed to filth or exposes that which is in the darkness so that it can come to the light. Uh, in the Bible, light represents honesty as opposed to lies, sheds light on that which is untrue, or brightness as opposed to depression. And so in other words, when the Bible says his face shine upon you, that word, it, it replaces, there's an upbringing or your, your countenance rises with God and we become brighter. That's the word and that's the meaning of it. Uh, so light has the ability to guide people through darkness, to draw people to safety, right? If you just hold the light out and people can come to that light, it, 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 light has the ability to expose weakness, to reduce crime. The single most effective and efficient crime deterrent is actually light. It, you turn the lights on and stuff scurries a, a, away. Uh, and it also, light reveals color. I don't know if you realize this, but things don't have color. This does not have color. This doesn't have color. Nothing has color. They simply reflect light in a manner that our eyes pick up, and that's how we have 
color. It's actually light that gives things color. It's fascinating. So as LEDs, light-emitting disciples, we help people come to Jesus recognizing the things that are wrong and give, let them live in the full color world that God designed and desired us to live in rather than the gray, drab, boring life that they have lived all of these years. We are here to help. And, and, and who really wants to go back to a black and white? Of all of the retro things in the world, who wants to go back to a black and white TV? And yet that's what the world is like without salt and light, without us in the world. We, they don't even realize all that we are doing as believers in Jesus to preserve this world from what it would be if we were not here. We are light and we are salt. When Jesus said you are the salt of the world, the light of the world, he meant that while the world waits for his return, We are the ones that keeps the world from falling into utter and complete decay, from living in complete darkness and utter sickness and violence and despair. We are. Okay? So now it says that there are not only two you are's, but there are two impossibilities. Salt really can't become unsalty, and light can't really be hidden. It just can't happen. Salt, if it's salty, it's salt. If it's not salty, it's not salt. It's a chemical impossibility. So if there's something, so I say, honey, what is this in the salt shaker? Well, I don't know. Put it on the French fries and see what it tastes like. If it's not salt, then throw it out. Because you don't want that on your food, right? Throw it out. Trample it underfoot, okay? So salt can't, cannot be, and the same way light Actually, you can't hide this. If a city set on a hill, in the old days, the the cities were built primarily out of limestone, which was white. And if you were to light something up inside, the light finds its way out. My grandfather, back in World War II, was an air raid warden. And when the siren would go off, uh, he lived in Baltimore on these coasts. And the sirens would go off. Everyone had to pull their dark out, their blackout shades down. I don't know if they had them around here. Blackout shades down and turn all the lights out because a tiny little light could be seen by miles and miles away by bombers. And all they would do is look for the light because you can't hide the light for a city on its hill. Jesus was saying, if you are my followers, you cannot help but impact the world, the world. It's impossible not to. If you are my followers, you will preserve it from being its worst. You will draw people to hope. You will brighten the world up with living color. It's an impossibility not. If you're doing, if Jesus is really your Lord, if he is your follower of Jesus, this must happen. It's impossible not to. Now, there's also one big, why would you in this passage? So verse 15 says, nobody lights up a light and covers it up with a bucket. Come on, why would you do that? Well, it's just plain goofy, right? So lamp oil back then was quite expensive. You think electricity is expensive. Lamp oil would be even more expensive. And so if you light up a lamp, you'd better be putting it in a place where everybody can see it. If you're going to light a lamp up, my goodness gracious, you don't put it under some sort of bucket where it's not. That'd be, I mean, I'm known for, I'm known for turning lights off because there's nobody in the room. If we're not there, just turn it, turn it off. So if you're going to light something up, make sure that everybody can make use of. Jesus' point was very simple. He said, if you're a Christian, why would you put a lid on the light? Why would you act as if you didn't have Jesus in your life? Why would you turn a flashlight on, wrap it up in tinfoil, put it in a bag, stick it in your pocket? Why would you do that? In a like way, why would you do that to Christ? This last week, I, uh, I bought new headlights for my 12-year-old pickup truck because 12-year-old lights and 57-year-old eyeballs, both of them are pretty dim. You know, and so all this time, I'm driving around just blowing the horn. You look out, I can't see nothing. You know, 
And so I bought headlights, nice bright ones. I mean, the brightest ones they make. I'm an editor. And I put them in the glove compartment. That wouldn't make any sense, $44. I'm not going to put them in the glove department. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to install them. So I installed them. Now I can see all the people I'm <laughs> running over. Hey, if you don't like the way I'm driving, just get off the sidewalk. That's what I say. So why would you, why would you have the light of Jesus in you and drive you all over? It doesn't make any sense at all. If you're married, why wouldn't you tell people? You know, why would you hide something like that? If you're a Christian, it should be clear to everyone, not because you're a religious nut, but because your life, listen, because your life makes everyone else's life better. Okay? Hmm. Does my life make anybody else's better? Does my existence in my neighborhood improve my neighborhood? Does my existence at the job make people better? Hmm. Now, let's talk about the big idea. Because here's the big idea, verse 16. Let your light shine before people in such a way that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So all the you are's, the impossibilities, the why would you's, lead to the big idea Not so that we can be seen, but so that others can see in us, by the way that we live, Jesus. Now, perhaps you're wondering, how is it that I get to be the light of the world? Is it because I have such a charming personality? You know, is it because I'm just such a, a person I'm writing up? No, of course not. How did we get to be the light of the world, it's only one reason. It's because Jesus, who is the light of the world, is in you. And you did nothing to get this way. It is God who decided to inhabit you. You invited him in, and he, he, here, let me explain this to you. Because he is, you are. So John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Right, I am the light of the world. John, the Gospel of John, in, in, in introducing Jesus, said, John 1, 14, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 9 says, he was the true, there was a true life, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So when Jesus comes in, <clears throat> out comes the light. So you are the light of the world because Jesus is the light of the world and Jesus is in you. Again, the flashlight. This flashlight is not a light because it's a flashlight. This light is a flashlight because there's a bulb and batteries inside. It's what's the bulb and the batteries are what makes this thing shine, right? That's why it's not because it is in itself something bright and helpful. It's because of what is in. And Jesus, inside of you, makes you a light-emitting disciple. If Jesus is in you, he can't be hidden. And why would he? And why would would we? So the big picture is so that God is glorified. Being light is not about us being light. It's not about others seeing. It's, it's, It's not about others seeing what we do. It's about others seeing the light in us and being drawn in God's direction. So for clarification, you are not the light, neither am I, nor are we the focus of what happens in the light. Jesus is the light, and he is the focus. Well, how not to be the light? Well, being light in the world is not criticizing the darkness. It isn't cursing the darkness. That's not what being light is. It's not pointing our fingers at the darkness and saying, oh, you're so dark and you're so bad. Criticizing the darkness seems like being so helpful, and it's trendy these days. But I have to tell you, nobody likes being criticized, and nobody in being criticized says, well, gee, I'd sure like to be more like you. In fact, when we criticize the darkness, we're actually more like them. Right? Uh, So Philippians 
2.14. Actually, to be honest with you, when this whole mask thing came out, and uh, Pastor Hollis did something irritated daylights out of me, he quoted Philippians 2.14, which has been ringing around in my head now for months, which says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. I am not good at that. And it doesn't say some things. It says all things. And But if you listen, see, he, let's just continue reading the scripture. It says, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Now, doesn't that make more sense? If you, if you do everything without grumbling or complaining, it's going to ruin your day at work on Monday. If you do everything without grumbling or complaining or arguing, you become the children of God among the criticizing and the dark and the awful world out there. And you don't become one of them. You become lights that are shining in a dark world. It, so don't be a... Cursing the darkness is not being the light. Strobe light is not being the light. It's not like it's strobe lights. You know, they're great for parties. Oh, they're a lot of fun, but they're not good searchlights. <laughs> they're, where is it now? They're terrible for trying to, you try and find your contacts on the floor when somebody's using a strobe light. Come on now. It is not helpful to the word. It is not helpful. You can be on again as a Christian, off again, bright, dim, yes, no, only makes it look like this Jesus thing isn't really worth living. You are not a good light if it's now and not and then and now. So being, being a spotlight, well, that's not a good light to the world. Beaming like you're the attention of the world, look at me, oh, That's more blinding than it is helpful. That's shining a light in people. It's like blasting a bullhorn rather than being a light in the world. In fact, here's something. Often the loudest speaker is the dimmest bulb. I say that knowing that I'm the loudest one in the room right now. Often the one that is the loudest about things is the one that's not so bright upstairs. So the big idea is that you and I are the light of the world because the light of the world is in us so that we could be seen among people, not so that we are seen, but so that they would see the light, the who that is in you and be drawn to you. So while we wait, while we wait, reach out by being the light in the world and shine your light in such a way that when people see you and what you do and how you do it, they say, there must be a God in heaven, and I must have him. That's what it is. Matthew 4, 16. Matthew, Jesus quote, Matthew quotes in Old Testament verses, there was that those who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. They paid attention to it. They're sitting there in darkness. Sitting there in darkness. And I have to think maybe, maybe Matthew's thinking of his own story. We're down, down a couple of chapters. Matthew is found sitting in his tax booths, just sitting there collecting taxes, being hated by everybody. And Jesus comes along and <laughs> just loves him and says, hey, I know you. Sitting in darkness, you saw this incredible light. So are you waiting for something? Are you waiting for anything? Shine. You waiting for a job? Shine. You waiting for retirement? Shine. You waiting, you're waiting for the mask thing to end? Shine. Waiting for restaurants to open? Shine. You waiting for school to be normal? Shine. You waiting for an election to be over? Shine. Are you waiting for riots to end and racism to be over? Let your light so shine before men that they will see what you do and they will say, I want to be a light like that. Be a light like that. 
Let's have the worship team come. We're going to have communion in a moment. If you do not have one of these communion pieces, there is uh, Emily. Can you just grab that bucket uh, and bring it close by? She has, in fact, if you raise your hand, she'll come, she'll come by. There's also one up front here. This is communion. We do it just for the little primer. There's two layers. There's a cell phone on top. Pull that so you get to the wafer and the bottom when you get to the juice. If you're welcome to join us in communion today. If you become a believer, if the light of Jesus Christ is in you, you're welcome to come and, and, and join us. Because part of the communion thing is, okay, if you think about this, how often we, we share these same words. As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, what is it now? The Lord's death until what? Until he comes. This is what we do while we wait. What do we do? We proclaim by being the light of the world the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes. Until he comes. You know, lights, this, this, this light works good if I push the button. But if there's stuff on the lens, it doesn't work real good. If there's scratches all over it, it doesn't work real good. There's a number of ways that, that the light in you can be diminished. And that's what communion's really all about. It's about forgiveness. It's, it's about restoration. It's about redemption. It's about making relationships right. It's about fixing what is wrong. It's about taking all the scratches out and they're gone for good. It's about cleaning up the lens so it's no longer dirty. Wouldn't you like that? Wouldn't you like to start all over? Wouldn't you like, wouldn't you like just to say, I'm so glad that's gone. That's what communion's all about. The Bible says, the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread out and just hold it for just a moment and let's pray together and give thanks. God, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to participate in broken bread, broken your broken body, so that the penalty that we owed is now paid, the forgiveness that we so crave is now granted, the restoration, the redemption that we desperately need is freely given. We need this in order to be the help and the hope of the world around us. We, that the world desperately needs us for us to go through this process where you now have taken away all of our sins and made us to look like you. And so we thank you and we receive your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's, let's eat together. Well, Jesus went on again after that. It was actually a little while. We think it was so quick. But it says after supper. And he took a cup and he said, this is the new covenant to my blood. And that's when he said, as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim, you shout, you declare, you make a big deal of his death until he comes. So let's, let's drink together. Will you stand with me and let's just kind of seal the deal with Jesus. If you're here today and you have not accepted Christ as your Savior, you're distant or far from God and looked at that light and said, sure wish I could have what they have. You can have what they have right here and right now. You can receive that gift today, here. In fact, if you need prayer or you like prayer, then why don't you just come down while we're singing and a couple of people right in the corner, they'll just pray with you. It could be for healing. It could be for some issues you have at home, some struggles, some hopes, some dreams. Maybe you need help with your repentance. You need help, someone to help you. They're here. So we'll sing together, and I'll come back in just a couple of minutes. Simple. 
together and again if you'd like prayer don't go away let's come forward rather than go out but goodness gracious let your light so shine toward people that when they see you they don't recognize you they immediately say there must be a God in heaven and I want to know it let's pray thank you God for enabling us to be right here in your presence and as we go, I pray, God, that you would help us to shine up the world, brighten up the place, make things more colorful, bring joy where there is sadness, but more than anything else, whether through our hardship or our joys, whether it's easy or hard, whatever we do and however we do it, that we give honor and glory to your name because you deserve it. Empower us with your spirit because we need it. We thank you in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a very good day. By your stripes I am healed. By your death I will. The power of sin is overcome. It is finished. It is done. By your stripes I heal, by your death I live. The power of sin is overcome, it is finished, it is done. By your stripes I heal, by your death I live. The power of sin is overcome, it is finished, it is done. Stripes I'm healed, oh, by your death I live. The power of sin is overcome, it is finished. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, as a prisoner. With your blood, you. Jesus, I was a prisoner, now I'm not, now I'm not, with your blood, you, you are my friend.